welcome, Dr. Lagerman. It's so great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see you guys again. Thanks for having me. Well, we always enjoy our conversations and like all the other recordings we do, we always have good conversation right before we hit the record button. So I have to begin. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, I guess jumping jumping in the first question, uh, with with COVID, what, what have you seen? As we as we come as we look, looks like we're, like we're coming out of COVID, what have you what, what have you seen from mental on a mental health basis? That's a great question. So we've all experienced COVID, and um, you know we all went through that really anxious, provoking time the first months of it, where you really didn't know if going outside of your home would cause you trouble. Um, I think then we all we settled into some functioning, but we were very isolated. And what we've learned in my field is that people did not do well with that isolation. Um, Perfectly healthy people didn't do well, per se, um, but certainly older individuals and individuals with any kind of chronic illness didn't really didn't do well. Um, The social part was one part of it, but I think also the physical isolation and touch. So it was, it's kind of a lot of different pieces. So, I mean, it was not talking to people, but not seeing people having no hugs, no interaction. Um, All those things impacted um, like mental health, like you bring up, but also it caused some, um, I think cognitive decline in some people and also even physical decline um, where people were not, we could say with Parkinson's, they weren't going out to exercise classes and things, but independent of just not exercising, even if you exercised at home, your physical health was probably declining. And we also, as a culture, saw a lot of people not get screenings and surgeries done that they pushed off. So, I mean, that all that sort of boomerang. So we had mental health and physical changes. Um, What we kind of recognize is that there was just a huge um, need for therapy and psychotherapy and counseling services that has really boomeranged. Um, I think a positive thing that's come out of it is that we started to figure out telehealth. Um, The VA has done telehealth for years, but we now have therapy providers doing telehealth therapy all over the country. Um, And that has, I think, worked a lot better than we ever expected. I never used um, Zoom for therapy or any kind of clinical service. And I have had people that I've worked with that I've never met in person. And I've had people that I know from pre-COVID and meeting in person, and we do things um, by telehealth. And I would say both have been very effective for both groups. Um, and that's been a huge um, gain for access to care. Um, but we also recognize we don't have enough mental health providers in this country for all the needs we have. So that's a real struggle. Um, well, and, and would you say that um, because we have the telehealth that you notice that people who never access those uh, mental health resources at all, whether it be in person or telehealth or telemedicine, did, did they start to use it bef- maybe before things got worse or? Um, I think there, you mean like greater access, like people seeking care that probably didn't before. Yes. I think there has been some uptake of that. We, I certainly see, I have a number of patients that are quite far away from our center physically. So I see people from two or three hours away in Virginia that would would not have access to a therapist locally and certainly not be able to come to our center for care regularly. Um, and I do think there's a little less, I mean, we have a long way to go with stigma, but I do think people access Zoom and other ways of doing virtual therapy that it's very private. You know, you, you can be in your own room and never really tell anyone that you're doing this. So there's, um, I think some people feel very, comfortable with that. And also the physical issues with getting somewhere, whether it's transportation or their mobility is all removed. So they, um, that works very well for people. So it has opened up that, which is nice. Um, and Sarah, can you come in at all about care partners and how, how that, how the telehealth may be, or, or teletherapy might be 
um, helping care partners find for those exact reasons, mm-hmm. no transportation, not having to leave the home. Oh yeah. Um, because a lot of people, especially if the person they're caring for, you know, requires a lot more care, they don't feel comfortable leaving them for long periods of time. So just going in another room and having a session is a lot more accessible. Um, and that's a benefit. Um, I also think, I think COVID in a way, going back to that, it's all become more okay to talk about anxiety and the issues we're having. And so there's a little bit of, um, you can go to see someone for that, even if you're going really for another purpose and COVID is an extra layer of the problem, right. but not the original problem. Um, I I do see um, care partners alone. So there's a lot of people getting help just for themselves, but then sometimes it's a couple coming in to kind of talk about all the adjustments that they're making. Um, that can vary throughout the the course of Parkinson's. So I have a new couple that I'm working with that it's very much, you might reminisce about this, but it was kind of crisis mode, you know, diagnosis, getting to doctors, and their relationship got all out of whack and became Parkinson's focused. You know, it's just going to doctor's visits, getting the right physical therapy, getting treatments. And, you know, COVID happened during that for them. Um, but they're coming in saying, like, that's all we do, you know, and we don't have our marriage really. And how to... um kind of reset that balance so that you're addressing the Parkinson's, but you also have a marriage and your independent lives outside of all that so that you're um, really kind of having support from a lot of different avenues versus just being focused on that. Um, I think that's a really important point. Um, I know that's something that we recently talked about in our relationship as we've slowly kind of started to go out more and started to go back to in-person, you know, for instance, mm-hmm. fitness, you know, mm-hmm. whether it be rock steady or the gym for me, you know, we finally said exposure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we finally uh-huh. kind of got over that exposure anxiety as, uh-huh. and, um, but that realization getting back to the, we have to do things independently again. Oh yeah. Without mm-hmm. fear of, exposing our loved one that's a big one it was for me oh, yeah I, I, I think it still remains it was is that is that distress or is, is that is that ptsd and is, is, is it, what, what? that's a good question you know i mean i experienced this myself like i don't recall in my relationship ever being like when are you coming back you know i was never like <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, you know, and you know, you would just go to the store or you'd come back, but then it became like going to the grocery store was like an outing to something that was like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're gearing up for the grocery store. Right. Um, and then like, and then when you come back, you're like, are you okay? You know, this infection, like, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you okay? Like what, you know, it was the grocery store, but, um, so I think we all, we all have experienced different levels of that. And I also, you didn't mention this, but like I've noticed when I go into a store, it's a little bit better now, but when I first would go in, if there were a lot of people, I would just be like, I can't be in here. I can't, like it was anxiety. You know what I mean? Just, I haven't been around this many people and it's not comfortable, you know? No, and it wasn't I... just the risk of infection. Even if they were all wearing masks earlier, it was just like, this is too much stimulation. <laughs> like, whoa, I'm used to seeing one person a day, you know, mm-hmm. which is a huge shift, you know, for how we lived our lives. Um, and I think a lot of people are in the position you're describing now where it's not gone, but we're going to more things in public, trying to figure out how to do that. When do you wear a mask? Um, trying to be cognizant of what are the risky situations to avoid if you have a loved one with more risk for poor outcome with COVID. Um, but also kind of getting back to, you know, things we typically did. So it's not completely shut down and it's not all zoom and, you know, which, um, that's a, that's a personal thing. Some people, I know some people have minimally adjusted their lifestyle. So it's not a big change and other people have not been out at all. And every going out is a big, deal and probably most people are somewhere in the middle where they kind of do some things but not others um but it is it's a big shift and 
it's good to talk about that shift because I think we are like a little more anxious and a little more um, where we monitor that, like, how was it? You know, those kind of questions. It's not like just relax, like it was a good time, you know? And so it's like trying to recognize what makes us anxious and how to change that. Cause you don't want to, I always tell people anxiety fills whatever space you give it. So if you are anxious about going to the grocery store, you might be, become where you're anxious going anywhere. You know what I mean? And you want to um, try to rein that back in. But I think we've all had a massive dose of anxiety producing um, stress. And I don't think of it necessarily in terms of PTSD, but like, I mean, people could have PTSD from some of these things, but I don't think the average person does. Mm. Um, but um, anxiety, I guess, I guess yeah, that. more guess anxiety. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, and, and is it situational anxiety? Like your, mm -hmm, your, yeah. your brain at some point realizes you're in a particular situation and then it starts to drift over to being anxious versus being more balanced. Like, you're, uh -huh, like you yeah. said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I, I think for the people who are reviewing this, you know, the, I think you make an excellent point. You need to talk about it, mm -hmm. whether you talk about it with your spouse or your mm -hmm. friends or your counselor somebody you know you need instead of pushing it down it needs to come out and be yeah. exposed right yeah and just I mean it, it is like the elephant in the room but it's like getting together with a friend you can be like oh yeah I haven't been in a restaurant like this uh close to people without a mask and how is that you know or you know um when you go back to rock study for the first time like are things more spaced out and you know, I find, I mean, when someone coughs, you know, and they don't have a mask on. I did that like, yesterday. Started, yeah, we were starting to like move away from them. So, I mean, you know, we all are navigating these things, but um, or they're sneeze. challenging. Yeah, no, Steve yeah. needs. And it's, it's going to be, we're almost 82 today. So we're going to be experiencing allergies and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I do. My head does turn when people cough. Oh, yeah. I, I feel I'm so funny, bad. You know. Something I realize is like I go into the bank sometimes and most people are pretty good about the spacing of the line, but like a few, occasionally someone will get really close to you in a grocery line or grocery lines are pretty close, I would say nowadays, but the bank people are still kind of spaced a little bit. Um, but I don't really want people literally a foot from me, really. I would prefer them to be further out. <laughs> Well, and I, right before we started recording, I talked about going, we went to the theater on Valentine's Day and that lady uh -huh. was sitting right next to me and I was like, okay, don't see yeah. <laughs> this is This is an exposure, you know, they, in some cases of anxiety, you do exposure therapy, which is literally going out to the place and then doing your self-calming mental thoughts, breathing behaviors, whatever you have, the different things that you're using to help you cope with that. So well, yeah. um, mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy, is that, is that what you're kind of alluding to some kind of, yeah, like challenging your thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, like cognitive behavioral therapy is the standard for, you know, you go into the grocery store and you say, well, now I'm feeling anxious. Like what, what, what was the behavior was walking into this place where some people are not wearing masks and then. Um, your thoughts about it, like everything is probably filthy, which <laughs> is my first thought. And and then like the accuracy of that, you know, and how much our immune systems really do manage most low level bugs, you know, that are on doorknobs and carts and whatnot. And then um, your thoughts about it, you know, just calming yourself down. That doesn't mean you can't like when the person coughs, you can't move your cart to another aisle and say, you'll go back later. I mean, that's an okay behavior decision, but you know, like you with the lady in the, the theater, I mean, you might say, no, I need a seat beside us uh, empty. Or you may say, you know, if in your area that that isn't feasible, that this is what I have to deal with. I mean, then do you decide to put on your mask or not or whatever, but well, yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy kind of helps you challenge though your we tend to go into catastrophic or all or nothing black and white thinking which is not always logical and healthy um but then there's also other therapies like i 
said like the relaxed breathing or um, some people use like rubber bands on their wrists for thought stopping techniques. Like don't think the automatic negative thought think most of these people are well, we all have good immune systems. I won't be in here long. You know, the things that help you, you know, mitigate that. So what were you going to say? No, uh, I guess uh, it's just similar, uh, similar to, I would, as, as, as I mentioned, deep, deep breathing, uh, uh-huh. deep breathing. I, I find deep breathing uh, very, very, uh, if you're, if you're, um, when, when you get anxious, very, very beneficial. Yeah. You know, you know, I encourage a lot of people to practice that. It's great. You do that. Um, some people with Parkinson's find, I always tell people don't strain. You might not be able to move and fill your lungs as much as you probably feel like you used to mm-hmm. because of rigidity or things, but just to kind of slow your breathing down and get as much as you can, whatever that is for you. Um, we are generally shallow breathers and we, um, taking that deep breath literally tells your brain, it sends all the signals to your nervous system that you are relaxed. So that's good blood flow, relaxed muscles, digestion, all those things versus, you know, when we tighten up, we're, we're literally going back to that fight or flight thing that we had the first few months of COVID where, you know, you have less blood flow, less digestion, you're, you're running away from the lion on the Serengeti and it's not it's a cortisol stress for your whole body it works in the moment but is not right. good long term no, you know for no. coping yeah well and um i i also use my hands sometimes like you were talking about the power of touch you know and mm-hmm. and although we were there were you know the the no hug times and not getting oh, yeah. together with family or a pat on the back yeah. or something like fist that bumps. or fist bumps yeah. you know elbows remember that elbows. Elbows. <laughs> yeah. I did that yesterday yeah, yeah. yeah. you yeah. know sometimes if I just touch my heart or I touch my belly uh-huh. button area I can and breathe with that right. yeah that. it'll snap mm-hmm. into place and it just yeah it does take it's transformative uh, but you do have to practice it that's the yeah. Yeah, it does. I always tell people it's not like it's going to work the first time. It's really the practice of it that helps you teach your body to calm down like that, that then you can call on in a tough moment. Um, But the power of touch, I mean, that's not my area, but we know people um, decline mental health and physically with um, less touch. So um, what what about dehydration and and, and 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 the brain and, and and the brain is is well that's a broad question we have we have a new um uh doctor here who joined our clinic whose specialty is autonomic disorders and i've listened to several of his lectures but dehydration is a huge issue for people with parkinsons it's huge for any of us um your blood volume obviously goes down so your blood pressure goes down um, people can have our blood pressure is changing all throughout the day. I didn't really understand that. So it's not just whether you're sitting or laying down, but it's, it's fluctuating. Um, but as you may know in Parkinson's, just that, that response of the vessels constricting to stand up when you stand up, you might get lightheaded that orthostatic hypotension. It's just not happening as quickly. Um, but a lot of people over time just have a lot more, um, orthostatic hypotension. And if you're dehydrated, that's going to exponentially make it worse. Um, There are lots of different um, strategies for dealing with the orthostatic hypotension, but obviously hydration is needed in general, um, you know, just for your whole body health. Um, Yeah, a long time. Go ahead, Sarah. That's okay. I mean, I I think I read somewhere once, by the time you're thirsty, you've been dehydrated. So it's like, you really need to keep hydrating. The one comment I'll say is I often talk about how many times do you get up to go to the bathroom at night? And then we want to like slow down how much liquid you take at night, because I really tell people you one to two at most awakenings a night, getting back to sleep, you can still feel rested. But when people are up at three, four or five, it's, you're just not going to get that memory consolidation and all that we think happens as you sleep that's so important for cognition and attention and 
Yeah, but, it's, it's, it's a great, great, great segue into sleep. Oh, um, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sleep and mood. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I have experienced insomnia. So after you experience insomnia, you just have much more compassion for how awful that is. I mean, yeah, it's it's tough. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. We have some friends, unfortunately, you know, with their flavor of Parkinson's has a lot of sleep disruption no in it. And, um, it's, you know, uh, balancing all the other things, like when to take your meds, when to eat mm -hmm. and all of a sudden now you can't sleep for more than a few hours at a time. It's really disruptive. And you, just like you mentioned, you know, it's, it, there's so much stuff that goes on at nighttime while we're sleeping that, you know, when they wake up in the morning or, or they don't even, you know, they, um, real fuzzy yeah yeah terribly fuzzy they had mm -hmm. to stop driving because mm -hmm. of the fact that they weren't rested enough that they felt impaired when they drove and yeah it's been yeah. a tremendous challenge but if definitely a mood mood mm -hmm. a reducer you know uh, oh yeah the quality of their mood declines my irritability goes through the roof. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there might be depression, but there's also irritability. But, um, yes. <laughs> so, well, and you're upset because you're not sleeping and then oh, yeah, not sleeping very makes you more upset. <laughs> right. Yes. No, it's, it's a vicious circle. Um, and Dr. Berman, um, Brian Berman gave a good talk. Not, it was, I don't know how many months ago we did an in-person education day and that talk may be on our website. I'm not hundred percent sure, but he's a sleep specialist and he talked a lot about the different phases of sleep and what they do and how there is normal change as we age. So we don't go as deep into those different phases as I'm really simplifying this and they're not as long, but I mean, the more interruptions you have, just it, we know makes it that you're not getting into the cycles the way you should be, but also that you feel so um, groggy the next morning. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know from studies of perfectly healthy 20 year olds that if we um, limit their sleep, their memory and attention performances decline the next day. I mean, it's not, it's, it's immediate. <laughs> it's, it's there. Um, so there, uh, sleep is a huge area to to work on. Um, I do try to provide as a psychologist, I try to provide people a lot of behavioral techniques. I will say, and we all did this during COVID, you know, we stayed up watching the news, even though it was terrifying <laughs> or whatever. And now we have plenty of other reasons to be terrified of different things <laughs> happening in our world. Um, and I tell people, you, if you clean up all the behaviors and you still have sleep problems, then you can approach medicines, but they usually have some side effects. So they're not, they're not something you can just take and it fixes the problem, you know? So um, if you're not doing the behavioral things, you're kind of missing out on what could help at a fair amount. Um, I provide people that we really need a wind down routine. If you've had children, you know that you had the bedtime routine and things slowed down and you had brush your teeth, get in your jammies, read your favorite books. Um, you want a wind down routine. You you don't want bright lights that get through your eyes, um, that's turning off your melatonin. That's your, what helps you go to sleep. Um, I tell people the TV is probably not your best friend unless it's something pretty benign, like maybe like a nice bird show or something, but <laughs> nothing, nothing news oriented. Um, Bob Ross. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bob's painting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those trees. Um, yeah. um happy little trees. <laughs> yeah. And um I tell people to try to develop a relaxation routine, like listen to relaxing like spa or some sort of relaxing music that you like. Um, but you want to be letting your body know this is this is time. When we watch the news or TV and then jump in bed and don't fall asleep, that's not really a surprise. And when people say, well, I keep thinking, of course you do. I mean, you've just had all this stuff put in there. So you want to wind down. If you really find you have a lot of worries or thoughts, I tell people well before bedtime, you want to do a worry journal or you want to write those things down, literally put the journal somewhere else in the house. You don't want that at your bed, like sitting in bed thinking, what do I worry about? <laughs> no other room for that one and your bedroom should be you come in and it's soft lighting and you have this nice music on and um 
if you can smell, you can have a candle or a, a diffuser or something that you like, but, you know, but things that help you relax. Um, and, and then there's lots of the cell phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Basically electronics aren't really your friend at that time. Um, I do use a white noise maker all through the night and I do run that off my cell phone, but nothing else goes off on my cell phone. So it's just like a little machine over there doing it. Um, but I, that helps, um, if you wake up little incidental noises or things that can help. Um, also, if you don't know why you wake up, that whooshing sound can help lull you back to sleep. Mm -hmm. There's some other, um, techniques I've learned that I share with people, you know, that are, that are tips to try to get you back into sleep quickly if you're waking up too much. And so there's, I would say those things are at least somewhat, if not fairly helpful to a lot of people, they may not resolve everything, but I feel like if you, if you have some tools in your toolbox, you won't feel as hopeless. Mm. And we know our negative thoughts about not sleeping well, make us not sleep well again gets to be a really bad problem. So part of my therapy with people is trying to change the thinking so that the thinking isn't adding more problems to the sleep, you know, which I totally, as having experienced it, recognize. I mean, it's, mm. it's really hard not to be like, oh, it's going to be another terrible night and whatnot, but you're kind of setting yourself up for that. So, yeah. I, on a personal level, I found, I found, I, I haven't used Calm, but I use Headspace and I, I found Headspace uh -huh. a very helpful app for yeah, I have different patients use different ones. Like people find um, actors and sports people who've done recordings that they like their voice or whatever it is, like find the thing that kind of lulls you the most. Mm -hmm. um, I will say the things you use at night, like the story, just like the good night moon story, you want to do the same thing, the music or the stories, because it you're kind of like, just like we do with children, it's like a self-hypnosis thing. Like we read the same thing. They know what's coming on the next page. If you don't say it right, it's not okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's like, everything's the same and your body then knows how to respond. So um, I tell people like you do your breathing exercise or other things to relax during the day is good because usually throughout the day, our anxiety just keeps ratcheting up as we keep dealing with life. Um, but at nighttime, you want that stuff to be the the bedtime routine special because hmm. then your mind will associate it. Like literally, I hear the mix on my phone for the whooshing noise and I'm like, bedtime, and I'm <laughs> you know, ready to go. So it helps. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, the most important point you're both bringing up, I think, is that you have to intend, be intentional about setting the pattern and, mm -hmm. and you have mm -hmm. to not do it just for one night or one oh, no. night. yeah, you yeah. probably need to do it at least for a few weeks so that your body starts to pick up the pattern and says, oh, hey, you know, that means it's time to wind down. Oh, yeah. 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 Classic sleep um, work says to go to bed and wake up at the same times. I have, I always have a hard time giving advice that I don't follow. So I do like to sleep in later than my early clinic mornings on other days, <laughs> which means I'm not sleeping enough. And I know that. Yes. <laughs> um, but generally like within an hour, you know, it doesn't have to be super tight, but pretty tight. Um, the other thing we that associates with is napping. So a lot of people need naps as Parkinson's progresses, just the amount of physical exercise your body is doing to stand upright and do everything wears you out. Um, early morning or early afternoon naps um, are healthy if they're short, early and don't disturb your nighttime sleep. So right. um, when people are napping at three, four and five o'clock, which we all get that lull, that's the worst time to do it. That's when you should take a walk or do jumping jacks or something. And I don't know what, but wake yourself up. But I mean, like, I think right after lunch or at one, maybe two o'clock at the latest, taking a 30 minute to no more than an hour nap. If you find that time works for you and doesn't make you not fall asleep, then you've found what works, you know, for your um, amount of kind of illness issues that your body's experiencing with. And it can really help you not have that fatigue and real decline in walking and gait and everything um, that's around four and five o'clock, you know? 
So, a lot, and I heard Sarah a long time ago. Uh, the Parkinson's Voice Project had um, Dr. El Fecky did a talk. It sounds very similar to what Dr. Berman did, you know, talking about the rhythms and all that. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the light exposure that the eye and the brain need. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're in a dark house and you have your shades drawn all the time and it's dark 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 all then you're it's not helping you yeah no the brain doesn't you know the brain wants no. to see the light yeah. in the morning and it wants to see some brightness and that's why those days that we've had here in virginia recently that are gray, gray. all day you're like oh i'm so tired <laughs> you know because i think because the yeah your no, eyes literally you're light yeah i actually use um because I am a bear in the winter. I mean, I like to wake up with daylight. So in the winter, that does not really work where we live. Um, <laughs> so I have a, that big globe that literally does sunlight. So it, I, you can set it for whatever time. So over 15 minutes before I need to wake up, the sun rises and it's, it's much less jarring than alarm. Cause I used to turn off an alarm. I would have alarms further and further away from my bed and I could get up and turn out all of them and still go back to bed and never wake up. So <laughs> I was really good at sleeping, but, um, that, that sunrise really works for me that I'm more alert. And then I do have myself some lower mood in the winter months. And I now I'm using a light box um, that just sits while I eat breakfast and get going. And that's a very bright light. And it makes you realize we're, we're not around that kind of light in the winter, you know, at all, naturally, even, you know, even if you have lots of windows, um, and that does uh, help alertness. And, um, I think generally helps set, set your awake and your sleep times good. So there's lots of tools to use like that, um, that are not just PD specific, but, depression or anything yeah mm -hmm. well uh, I, I i i like i like a good nature photograph i i i find you when you when you like during the winter when you when you can't when you can't go when you can't see see uh nature at, at, oh you like to watch something or yeah, yeah. Or, 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 or a good photograph uh-huh seems, seems to yeah, going back to you mean like summer photography yeah, summer, 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 or yeah. spring oh, photography yeah. where things are blooming and um you know you, you see the light in the photograph is very, yeah that's a good that's a good suggestion yeah. yeah I have a picture on my desk at home that I literally took while on vacation in Italy and was like I want to remember how I feel in this chair looking at this ocean and it's I look at it and I'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> well and um Sarah, I want to ask that, you know, being that you, you counsel a lot of people about their mood, you know, do you find that there are these like little things that people can do that just have an enormous impact? You know, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's not maybe necessarily a, a therapy level thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's just a small thing that kind of boosts, yeah. you know, happy memory. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I attended a talk during COVID, I think, but it was by our HR department. Um, and that social worker kind of prepared, um, provided a lot of like instant little things that help you cope, like with whatever instantly. So, I mean, I think there's a, a use for any of these tools, just you have to recognize what they can and can't do. Some people, I mean, you, you probably know that about 40 to 60% of people with Parkinson's can develop depression. Um, that doesn't mean everybody does, but if you have a prior history of it years ago, you're at more risk, of course, for it. Um, and the main thing is to treat it because we know it makes the motor symptoms worse as well as your quality of life. So it's both, um, you know, and some people might have a level, they need an antidepressant medication. Um, but other people dealing with the adjustment to it, if they don't have more severe depression might find a lot of activities, the social, the touch, the different things, the exercise. We didn't emphasize that enough, but exercise, you can't do too much exercise. So we we just have to have that. Um, little things can help just cope with the momentary things that happen in life. I'm at work, so I don't have it with me, but actually from her talk, I bought one of these squeeze dolls that looks like um, 
it looks like a little doll that's being tortured. <laughs> so <you laughs> poke its eyes and then they pop back and <laughs> it makes you laugh. You know what I mean? So if you're in a meeting that you think is going on and on, you poke those eyes and you think <laughs> better. Um, so there's lots of little things like that that are kind of like stress relief. Like, that's funny. Like, you, you know, some people put on their desk their favorite anime characters or like I have a Grogu doll that I love the um Grogu so you know it's just different things that you know bring a chuckle or that photograph of Italy or your favorite place or favorite food you know that can kind of help you just go oh yeah there's other things this will pass you know um but you know those things won't work for more severe symptoms but I mean it's good to have a range of all of them, I would say. So, um, I was going to say, but the power, the power of laughter. I mean, oh the, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was in one of my talks I used to give was a picture of um, uh, yoga, laughter yoga. You know, where people just come into a room and then like one person laughs, it's like yawning, <laughs> like then somebody else laughs and like <laughs> everybody's laughing. But you know that that spreads just like the relaxed breathing spreads the um, neurotransmitters in your body to relax. Laughing sends, sends ones that you're relaxed, comfortable and happy. You know what I mean? And so you can um, experience that. Um, music is also great to change your mood. Music can help redirect you quickly. I tell people that a lot, like just putting on something positive that you like will help you shift that way, even if you're struggling with it. Um, but also things like changing what room you're in, taking a walk, exercise. We all usually feel better after exercise. We may not want to do it, but <laughs> we usually can say that was good that I did that. So um, yeah, but I mean, everybody finds it hard I would say almost everybody to exercise, but I mean, it is the most important thing to be doing. It helps your mood. It helps your sleep. It's great for your physical body and your Parkinson's. Um, and people often ask me about cognitive changes. Um, we really know that does better. And it's not just any exercise, but it's cardio intensive interval training is the exercise that helps memory improve so not just stay stable but actually improve for people with problems that's not like the drugs they can prescribe at best keep you technically stable but i would say the studies are not overwhelming for that um so we don't really know if they do or don't but if you're not exercising you're missing out on a huge bonus and by interval training i usually encourage people to look at a stationary bike or an elliptical, something they can hold on to, but be safe, um, not have trouble falling on. Um, a treadmill is probably too dangerous. Like if you trip, you can fall off them pretty easily. And we're talking 30 minutes, three times a week, you know, where you just set the machine to increase your heart rate and then decrease your heart rate and go back and forth. And most people will tell me they walk and none of us really can walk fast enough to get our heart rate up the way it needs to be for that brain health. It really needs to be that where you would find it hard to talk normally um, with a person. So if you can just carry on a conversation, you're not working hard enough. Uh, as, as far as men mental health, uh, mental, mental health uh, exercises, are, are, there, are, there, are there mental health exercises? You know, that question, I wish I could tell you like, oh, if you do crosswords, it's going to help you. It's we've done tons of different studies as a field. It's not any one thing, but I tell people your brain likes novelty and our lives, we get pretty routine. And I will tell you TV, even if you're watching something new is not great on um, real stimulation for your brain. It's pretty passive. Um, but like your brain likes to figure things out. So it's like, you know this when you play a game and you get better at it, then you need to switch and play a different game and get better at it. Like you just need that novelty. I do think it's good to try to do things where you have some challenge to figure out the thing, whether it's word search, doing visual puzzles, um, more complicated games, card games, whatever. Um, reading, reading is great. Um, some people have a hard time kind of keeping track of it, but maybe being part of a book club or something where you actually talk about what you read. 
all those things are good for your brain, but your brain does need to be stimulated. And I think after a lot of people retire, they're watching TV and not necessarily doing a lot of, you don't have to do complicated thinking, but at least challenges, you know, where you're trying to figure something out. Or, or you think languages might be a learn learn any language or oh that would be very high on the list. I once heard a talk and it was it was the kind of the the joke is if 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 you're learning a new language and feel how you're struggling that is the best you can feel your brain trying to work you know um, because it's so hard and that's great um, you know whereas if you're doing something that's a piece of cake your brain your brain kind of goes on autopilot and it turns off, you know, so, but you want to find the sweet spot of where it's challenging, but not so challenging that you're so frustrated, you're irritated with it. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. We yeah just but have a few minutes left, Sarah, was there anything else you wanted to leave with us? I mean, you've given us a wealth uh, of been, stuff uh, to work on, which uh, I know yeah. I don't have Parkinson's. I'm still trying to work on all of this. So. Yeah, <laughs> we all can. Um, you know, just it kind of dovetails with what we were just talking about, but like, tr I encourage people to take a new class of something you didn't do. You know, like we often as adults, we gravitate towards what we're good at and that's our job. You know, that's how we did our work. Um, but like take something you've never done or don't know anything about that's new learning for your mind. You know what I mean? And it is a little, um, can be a little anxiety provoking. Like people are like, well, I won't be good at it, but I'm like, that's, you, you don't have to be, that's the beauty of it is just let yourself try something out. You may find things that you enjoy. And, um, you know, I recently took a, a little hand sewing class. I'm not a sewer. <laughs> so, so that was new, but, um, you know, but I mean, I was like nothing ventured, nothing gained, you know, I mean, it was painless, relatively painless and, um, and I enjoyed it, you know, but like just try new things. And, um, I think, classes is a great way to meet people because you obviously have some common interest so sometimes when it is hard to meet people the gym can work that way but classes um there's a lot of adult education centers and things um a lot of things are still on zoom like national geographic or different places but you know at least some in person if you feel like you can do that would be good too at times but yeah carl just did an improv for parkinson's and the, wow, that's like high. That's that's high on the anxiety producing ladder. Well, yeah. but they were very clear. I mean, multiple times I was not participating. I was just, you know, having to be in the background. And they were very clear in saying, "There's nothing you can't do anything wrong." Uh -huh. And it's nice. just about experiencing what's happening. And and, and it is, it's, it's do you want of, to say more? It's a lot. It's a lot of fun. It, it, it's um, um, it it makes you think fast. It makes you. Uh, oh yeah. It make, makes you. Uh, Bring, bring, bring some create some some creativity um and a lot of laughter a lot of laughter yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it checks a lot of boxes and, 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 and maybe oh, yeah. a lot of nice people and uh it it uh, it uh oh via zoom by this zoom. is all via oh. zoom for yeah. oh, interesting we'll, we'll put some links in the in the bottom but yeah, yeah. It, it was it is amazing so I, as i hear you're talking i'm thinking about mm -hmm. what you just participated in yeah. uh, uh, is it social it, it's uh, um it's a, a mental it's all that activity yeah. yeah and a lot of these things like in my reports i ask people their cognitive engagement their social and their physical exercise and we know if you're active in all that really helps you stave off more decline or disability and all of those things could be combined you know like the gym could be if you're at rock steady it's a social element to it depending how much you want to engage in that and um the cognitive, you can do a class and make that more social. So, you know, there's ways of doing those things. So and, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, it combines it. It's verbal. It's, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. But I think the one thing that I hear you both saying is hope mm -hmm. and yeah. optimism. And I think those are really important as well. So I, I think you, you both checked a lot of boxes. When <laughs> yeah. you checked a big one, Angela, because you, like you said, you have to make the routine of it. You have to do it. And it, it is hard. That apathy can be hard. But like scheduling a time, I, that class I went to, if I hadn't paid and bought the ticket, I probably wouldn't have gone that morning. But you were going. You, know, <laughs> you, need, you need some commitment. So I, I enlisted the help of a friend. So that made it less painful. But um, 
but um, I tell people writing stuff down in your calendar helps um, scheduling a set time, going to a class where you do it. That's why we have trouble exercising on our own. You know, all those things help you get out there and do it. So, and this isn't just for people with Parkinson's. This is for everybody. Everybody. Your partners too. So you're not exempt. absolutely your yeah. partner. <laughs> oh yeah. Get, get yeah. My, it. my exercise is highlighted on my calendar. So I, yeah. 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 We really get multiple hard. alarms. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah. You're giving us a, a lot to think about. Thank you so well, much. Good. Well, it's great to talk with you guys. It always is. Thanks for having me. Thank you Take for care. coming Take and sharing with us, Sarah. We appreciate it. Thank you.